coming Sunday night. Uh, now tonight, Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, and as I was praying um, for tonight's message, this particular passage came to mind. One verse that I'll um, make clear, uh, but uh, the whole passage helps us. And so Philippians chapter 3, and uh, beginning there in verse 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it's safe. Beware of dogs. And he's not talking there about the animals, although that's not an unwise thing to do. Uh, he's talking in this particular section here about false teachers and false teaching. And so he says, beware. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. Uh, and uh, we touched on that passage of Scripture before, being reminded that he basically is referring to uh, the Jews here by that word concision. He is referring to them as mutilators. Now, you know that God had commanded that all the Jewish males be circumcised. Some began to think, of course, uh, as we see in the New Testament, that because they were circumcised as Jews, that surely they were in with God. And Paul had to remind them that circumcision is a matter of the heart and not of the flesh. Not everyone that claimed to be a Jew is a Jew. And so here he says, when you have this idea that some outward work is what makes you acceptable with God, uh, it's really a mutilation. And that's why he uses that word concision there. Um, be, uh, for we are the circumcision, uh, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The other putting all their confidence in the flesh. He said, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Now you notice that's crazy, that, not crazy, that's strange together. His religious zeal, he saw it as religious zeal, of course, that he persecuted the people of God. To him, as he was connected with these previous ones initially, the concision, to him that would have been the pleasure of God that he persecuted the true believers. And so uh, he, uh, he said uh, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, uh, the church, watch now, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Um, and so, but verse 7 makes a turn. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll help us look into not only the clear uh, emphasis of these verses, that is, of course, salvation by faith and not by works, but then also the implications that move on through that into our life as believers that we might be mindful uh, of the danger of self-confidence. Help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this is the passage in verse number 7 that the Lord brought to mind for tonight. Right there when he says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. And we're reminded by our Savior when he told us you could not serve two masters. Uh, he, also, um, uh, he also said that if we would, if we would uh, save our life, we'd lose it. But if we lose ourselves for Christ and for his work, we save it. Uh, we're reminded here that whether it's in salvation 
or in service to the Lord Jesus Christ, we really do have to decide whom we're going to serve. And uh, in the end, we're going to have to let one or the other go. And that's what we see not only in Paul's coming to Christ as Savior, but then also in the following verses, beginning in verse 13, that we'll touch on in a moment. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. On the one hand, he, he cast all, aside all of his earthly benefit. We'll look a little more at that in a moment. Uh, which included his religious position in the world, uh, he cast that aside that he might trust Jesus Christ by faith. And then all of that he put behind him, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, I count not myself, but forgetting those things, verse 13, which are behind and reaching forth. So he just put it all behind him, and he focused on uh, being faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, Christianity is about our being consumed with him. Now, there's a lot that's crept in there uh, that wants to call itself Christianity and Christian service, just like a lot has crept in and wants to call itself missions. And we kind of went through that a little on Sunday night. Uh, but, there, but, I, but Christianity means to be uh, a disciple of and follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can emphasize that until we're blue in the face, until the cows come home, and uh, somehow or another, we still fall into religious trappings in regularity. And our identity gets wrapped up in our religion instead of our Savior. But Christianity is a focus on Him, a relationship with Him, a fellowship with Him an obedience to him, a commitment to him. And Paul talks to us here from this passage and reminds us of some important things of which to beware. Now, it's clear uh, that Paul, if, if we want to look at verses 4 through 6, we, we see Paul's earthly pursuits. And um, uh, one of those, of course, included his religion. And that religion was a religion of good works. But uh, as, we ho- as I hope we'll see in, uh, here in just a moment, he excelled in that religion. He did. I'm going to tell you one thing. If, you would have, if, you, if we could have uh, packed up the Apostle Paul and taken him down, to her, uh, down here to our Master Club's regionals, uh, I guarantee you he could probably quote almost all the verses that they memorized. He knew the Bible. He did not know the God of the Bible until the Damascus Road. But he knew the Bible. And he was a Pharisee, not a Sadducee. And so that means he was conservative. He was orthodox in his belief. He would have had the same belief in uh, in one true and living God, uh, in the literal nature of the Scriptures. I mean, Paul would have believed all of that and still didn't know Christ until he met him personally on Damascus Road. It reminds me of a whole lot of people that were brought up in church. They know all the words and they know all the Bible and they know all the routines. They just don't know God yet. A lot of children are that way and um, certainly some adults reach that point. But Paul sought to be faithful to his religion. He excelled in it and it brought him profit in this world. He had benefit because of his commitment there. And... um, but it, 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 um, it was consuming to him. And as a result, uh, he would have had the same type of undue arrogance that some other religious people have. There were several things, uh, several prophets, several glories that Paul uh, held in his heart that hindered him from coming to Christ. And so if we want to see Paul's pursuits in verse 4 through 6, we see, first of all, that one of those pursuits, one of those glories, one of those hindering glories, let's put it that way, was his nationality. In verse 5, he said that he was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. He was proud to be an Israelite. He was proud to be a Jew. 
Uh, and uh, uh, he would have put a certain, and did put a certain uh, uh, measure of confidence in that as it related to his safety with God for the future. But it also uh, made him, of course, uh, quite uh, arrogant and judgmental. I mean, you don't hold the coats for people to stone Stephen unless you feel as though Stephen needs to be judged. And so he would have had this heart about him as it related to his nationality. He was a Jew by birth, uh, uh, and so he thought that made him something. Now, there are a lot of Americans that feel that way. And I'm not for going around the world and having an American apology tour. I, I, I'm not for, uh, I, I'm not for uh, uh, you know, taking... Uh, for granted or, 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 or thinking little of what is the greatness of our nation. You cannot look across the annals of history and not see the greatness of this nation, the United States of America. You can't do it. Look, uh, we, we have all of our views and, uh, you know, we, we talk about uh, international policy and all that other kind of thing. But... <laughs> Other nations pay attention to what we do and what we don't do. And there are certain of them uh, that uh, in their leadership that are certainly smarter than others who know maybe how far they can push, how far they can go, how far they can't go. And every administration is tested by these nations. Uh, I'm not giving a political speech. But what I'm telling you is I'm thankful for how God has blessed America. You know that I believe America is already under God's judgment. I've said that before. Um, and so that is, that is very concerning. Uh, but what I'm concerned about is that we feel like that as human beings, we're better than others. The Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I uh, remember one time visiting one of our favorite little restaurants in Japan, and, uh, and it was a yakiniku place. And it was a, it was a favorite hangout of all the military people. Matter of fact, uh, <laughs> watch out now. Uh, if, if I ever had a season where I wanted, if I, maybe you had some of those uh, uh, sheep, church member sheep that had wander off over time. If you, if you just visited this restaurant, you'd find him in there eventually. It was a great place to catch up with where some of them had wandered off to. <laughs> and uh, I, I was walking by a table one time of some, of some young, single GIs. And uh, they, they were new there. Uh, and uh, you can tell, you can usually tell. One way to tell is when they pulled up to a stop sign because they drive on the left side of the road in Japan. And when you pull up to a stop sign, they've also switched the turn signal and the wiper blades. So you could tell all the new people because when they pulled up to the uh, stop sign, they turned on the wipers instead of the signal. That's just the way that worked. Matter of fact, more than once, people would actually go out to their car and get in the wrong side of it. And some of them figured out how to not look so silly by uh, opening the glove box and act like they're looking for something, get out and come around, get in the other side of the car. <laughs> But I walked by this uh, table one night, and these single GIs are there, and they're trying to figure out what the food is. And one of them kind of vocalized this maybe unstated sense of superiority when they said, why don't they put these menus in English? And of course, my immediate thought was, because you're in Japan. You're <laughs> you did graduate high school. You know where you are, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm thankful to be American. Y'all know that. I, I rejoice in what God has done. But our nationality doesn't make us any better than any other group of people in the world when it comes to being saved. Now, I'll, I'll, that having been said, and I really don't have time for this, but you know, we watch, uh, you know, every season, every season of this, every year, this season, you know, we have these storms come through and they're awful. And, and, 
You know, they're going to be finding uh, uh, um, bodies and remains for a long time to come. And some of these uh, news interviews that they're doing are just heartbreaking. But when you listen to what some of them are saying, like, uh, you know, we want the government to bail us out, and where is the government, and all that other kind of thing, and uh, I don't have any problem with that, and I'm not here to preach about that. I, I'm just telling you, if there are funds that are supposed to be there and we're paying taxes, then the government ought to come through with them. Amen. I don't have a problem with that at all. What does concern me is how we figure out in moments like this how spoiled we are when there are nations in the world that live like Western North Carolina every day of their life. And um, I, I, again, I don't mean to belittle anybody or put anybody down, but it should be an eye-opener for us. It has been for me to, to watch and to realize once again that a rainstorm in just a little bit of time can take away everything you thought you owned. And maybe it does need to do that to remind us whom we really look to and trust or should in the first place. Now, I don't, again, I'm not trying to wish bad on anybody or anything like that. I'm just telling you that, as I've often said, life is bigger than we are. And uh, we are a little bit arrogant when we think we have life by the tail. Paul had this arrogance in his nationality. He also had arrogance in his ancestry uh, there uh, in uh, verse number 6 concerning zeal persecuting the church. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, verse number 5, circumcised the eighth day of the flock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. He was uh, part of this prominent family. Uh, and um, that caused him to have some a sense of superiority, maybe expectancy, even of favor, because he was of the family of Benjamin. Now, we don't need to dwell too awful long on this to realize that uh, there are a lot of people that, uh, that, ha that believe that their lineage, is, lineage has something to do with God's favor on their life. Uh, I don't know how many people through the years I've talked to uh, whose grandfather or father was a pastor or a preacher, an evangelist or something, and uh, but, uh, but their life is not anywhere near where those folks were living, and yet they think because of that. Matter of fact, when you talk to them, they go back to that. They, they, it's almost as if they're trying to twist God's arm because of what family they came from. Not necessarily for salvation, but for an expectancy of God's... And, and it'll come across like this sometimes when you meet them out and about. And they'll say, well, now... Uh, you, they, they have the idea that basically when you start talking to them about salvation and about church... They come across, oh, yeah, I know all that, and I, you know, I've been there, and I've done that. The idea is basically I don't need that anymore, and they start talking about the religious nature of their family. Uh, and, uh, but I'm telling you what a shock it's going to be for them when they pass from this life and face God, who they were born unto uh, is not going to matter a thing. At the judgment of God. Every person, every generation of any lineages, lineage has to come to Jesus Christ by faith as individuals. And they're accountable to live for him as individuals. It's a shame, really, that they try to steal some of their grandfather and father's rewards for their own when they get to heaven. And so this made him, uh, this made him uh, uh, the, the, again, uh, the focus here was on his, uh, him, him and his makeup, if you will. Not face makeup. His constitution, is that a better word? But then he wanted to focus also not only on uh, his nationality and ancestry, but his orthodoxy, he mentions in verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee. Now, I've already talked about that, and uh, so I don't want to bring that up again. Uh, but Paul had all the education he could get. He was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel and still didn't know the law in a way that brought him to Christ until he said that it was, it, it was when, the Bible, when, when the law said, Thou shalt not covet. And it wasn't just money and stuff he coveted. 
He was coveting success and fame and well-to-do and uh, in the sense of influence and power as a leader of the Pharisees. He was coveting all of that. And uh, so his, um, his, his education was there. And he was proud of that. He lists that here as a, as a line item on his resume as to why that he ought to have confidence in uh, the flesh. And even the best Bible education, if, you've, if you get it, thank God for it, if it's real Bible. Um, but it doesn't guarantee success and fruitfulness for the Lord to have that. Paul was focused on that. There are a lot of people that are confident because of their training. And they put their confidence in their training uh, instead of in God. But uh, we come down here to uh, verse number, uh, verse number uh, 6, and we see that Paul uh, not only made reference to his orthodoxy, but then he mentions in verse number 6, he says, concerning zeal, his fervency. Now, I don't know about you when you're witnessing to your friends, but there are a lot of your friends, no doubt they're religious. And when you start talking to them about the Lord, instead of talking about the day they got saved, they're going to talk about how fervently religious they are. <laughs> and they go to church and they say prayers and they give money and they volunteer down at the food bank and all this other kind of stuff they do. And they're very zealous at it. And, uh, but of course, you know, the Lord said, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God. That doesn't mean a thing in the world as it relates to salvation. But I know this is a Wednesday night crowd. Most all of us profess to know Christ as Savior tonight. But there are also those that are saved that put an overconfidence in their zeal as some form of, of bringing some form of pleasure to God. And so I got to thinking about that when I saw that word concerning zeal in verse 6. Uh, turn back with me to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 10. 2 Kings chapter 10. 2 Kings 10. And this is the part of the account of Jehu. 2 Kings 10 and verse 15, and when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jonadab, the son of Rechab, uh, coming to meet him, and he saluted him and said to him, Is thine heart right as my heart is with thy heart? Now, we've preached on this before, but I'm, I'm looking at a little different view tonight. And Jehonadab answered, It is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him into the chariot. All right. And he said, come with me and see. Come with me and see. All right. Now, that phrase, come and see, jumped out at me. And if you'll just bear with me a moment to look at a few scriptures, because I'm going to make a point. I hope that's what you're thinking I'm going to do. And uh, then we're going to bring things in for a landing. Because this sums up all of what was going on in Saul's heart. Psalm, Psalm 66. Psalm 66 and verse 5. Uh, well, verse 4 says, All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name, Selah. Come and see the works of God. He is terrible in his doing uh, toward the children of men. That word terrible has the idea of great and glorious. Uh, look over at Isaiah. So, so there you see, come and see the works of God. Uh, then if you'll go to Isaiah. Isaiah and chapter 66. Isaiah 66. Uh, and he says here, I will set a sign among them and I will send, uh, I'm sorry, 18. 
Is that what I said? 18. Psalm 66. What I tell you? 66, 18 is where we're going. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues. Watch now. And they shall come and see my glory. So he says, uh, I want you to come and see the works of God. Come and see the glory of God. Then in John, over in the New Testament, of course, that well-known passage of Scripture in John chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. And in verse 40, uh, 43, John 1, 43. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses uh, in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Now, who was he talking about? Jesus. Come and see Jesus Christ. Come and see the glory of God. Come and see the works of God. In Revelation chapter number 1, uh, sorry, Revelation 6 and verses 1, 3, 5, and 7, the beasts are uh, opening the seals. And what do, this, what do they say? Come and see. The power of God, his ability to uh, uh, judge the works uh, of God. Uh, and so we see this phrase, come and see the works of God and the glory of God and uh, come and see Jesus Christ and come and see the power of God. But that is not what Jehu said. He said, come and see my zeal. He never talked about what God was doing through him. Come and see my zeal. I put down here, when your come and see ends with me, <laughs> you're guilty of idolatry. Come and see my uh, zeal. Go, go over to uh, the last part of the chapter here in... Um, uh, in, uh, uh, in verse 29, 2 Kings 10, 29. And watch now, all that he did, come and see my zeal for the Lord. Verse 29, how be it? <laughs> From the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not. So bring that together now. From the sins of Jeroboam, Jehu departed not. To wit the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. Now, that was done. Those uh, 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 idols were put up. Idolatrous idols were put up uh, to keep the, keep the folks in their place. Make sure they didn't wander off to the other kingdom. Uh, you, you know, uh, if you read that, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's too far for you to have to go to Jerusalem. Hold, hold on now. Boy, that 20-minute drive to church, too far for it to have to go. Don't, don't worry about that. You can just worship at home. Uh-oh. <laughs> anyway, down in verse number 31, But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord, God of Israel, with all his heart. For he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, Jeroboam excuse me, which made Israel to sin. Now watch the graciousness of God in verse 31. And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jeroboam did not depart. I mean, uh, Jehu did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam. Now get this. Here's what I see. Why and how God did that's up to God, and I would never question that. He did this work of God. We was used of God. By the way, somebody said, well, no, that's a wonderful commendation. Wait a minute. God used, used the uh, nation of Babylon. God used Nebuchadnezzar. 
This is no commendation. It just means that God can use us in spite of ourselves sometimes for his glory. <laughs> but can you imagine, this, this picture is a whole lot of people's life. Some good thing done right in the middle and bookended by idolatry. Isn't that what it is? In verse 30, I lost my place now. Where was I? Oh, second. <laughs> verse 29, it's uh, the sin of idolatry. Verse 31, the sin of idolatry. And in the middle, he got commended for actually slaying the Lord's enemies. So uh, there was something going on in the life of Jehu that despite all the good he did, um, brought this uh, condemnation from God. My zeal. All right? If you know how to spell tonight, tell me the first letter of the word idolatry. Yeah. Ain't that about right? And that's what's going on with, uh, that's what's going on with Jehu here. Uh, he said, come and see. Uh, look, look what's going on, folks, because this kind of attitude that's going on and it can happen in our flesh and uh, can take over a, a church and any given ministry at any time really begins to undermine the power and effectiveness of God. What Jehu was saying was, Look at me. See me. Appreciate me. Look what I can do. Now, for me, as I thought of that last statement there, I was reminded of how childish this mentality is. Uh, any one of these two and three-year-olds around here will from time to time say something like this. Watch this. Watch me. Um, look at me. And that's what it's all about is the attention. Uh, look what I can do. Look how smart I am. Look how wise I am. Look how discerning I am. Look uh, how... Uh, much I am doing. There's no glory for God in that. Uh, it's a, it, a matter of fact, it's a dishonor to the Lord. Uh, and uh, this, this meism, it creeps in and, and takes over uh, Christian lives to the point, just like Jehu, uh, of the destruction of their testimony and their effectiveness and their fruitfulness for God. But not just that. This meism is reflected on the job. Have you ever had to work with somebody that was constantly trying to promote themselves? That's just a little bit awkward all the time, don't you reckon? And then uh, it can, this meism can happen in our family. Whether it's one spouse or the other, it can be a child in the family or maybe dad who uh, is, um, uh, you know, often uh, self-centered in his view of life. It can happen in our faith. Meism. It happened with the disciples. Right after Jesus washed their feet, they was arguing about who was going to be the greatest. It can happen in the Heart of a mama of a disciple who uh, came to the Lord and said, I want my sons to sit on either side. That was her meism. She knew she wasn't going to be able to sit at that side or the other, but she could glory if one of her children was. It's the same thing. It's the same heart of me and I. It's, it's the same thing that was. Uh, going on uh, in, the, uh, in the heart of those who were trying to be confident in their flesh, according to our text that we read earlier, it was what in, was in the heart of the apostle Paul when he, when he was just given by way of illustration. If there's anybody that could be confident in themselves, it was me. Me. And this meism can also re be reflected in a church. It happened to Saul. When, he, when God kind of picked him to, uh, to be the, the next leader of the nation of Israel, uh, Samuel was supposed to anoint him. They couldn't find him 
because he was hiding in the luggage. He did not want to be seen. But after he was anointed and, uh, you know, he began to taste of some of this, uh, uh, you know, he, matter of fact, his jealousy against David was the result of some of this attitude. <laughs> and so when the Lord finally pronounced judgment upon him, he said this, when you were little in your own sight. But at some point or another, life became all about you. Self-proclamation, self-exclamation, <laughs> uh, uh, self-preservation, and it was all about me. And he lost his opportunity as a result. So all of these brought profit and glory to Paul before he was saved. As he relates to his own, he's not talking about somebody else here. He's talking about his own life and his own lineage. All of it brought profit and glory to him. But it didn't stay there. And you see it gloriously on that Damascus road when the Lord appeared to him and he fell. And then he said, Lord, what Lord? Now there's another Lord, not just him. Lord. What wilt thou have me to do? And immediately he put himself at the service of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, when he referred to himself as a servant in the New Testament, he used the word that has the idea of bond slave. All right, let's look at a few verses here and then we'll pray. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, by the way, let me do this so I can finish as we read these verses. So when Paul says, but what things were gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ, really what was happening there was he was, he was, uh, he was having to count loss. Look, those things were the me of verse 7. I had to count all that but loss and not, but, but it wasn't just that it's gone and I'm going to miss it. That's not what's said here. What things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Not just the knowledge of Christ as Savior, but the fullness of Christ as his Lord and in his servant. He switched from finding his identity in himself to finding his identity in his Savior. And so because of that, you read these verses like 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 and um, uh, down, in, down, in verse number, down in verse number 8. He's talking here about the resurrection, how the uh, Lord had appeared to these apostles. Why? Well, appeared to all the apostles, 500 brethren at one, appeared to all those guys, watch now, and last of all. Now, you got to think that at this particular moment, that, just meant, that meant more than just last in order to Paul. We talked on Sunday about Elisha and how that he was the last in line of those oxen and, and uh, 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 ox carts and ox, ox, plows uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> yoke of oxen. And, uh, and Elijah put his mantle on him. He was the last one by. Paul saw himself as the last. And too many believers see themselves as the first. He said, and last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. That am not meet to be called an apostle, apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul was basically saying, I don't deserve what the Lord has done for me. And if I could, I'd turn it back in so he could hand it to somebody else. But it's by his grace I am what I am. That's how Paul viewed himself. He didn't see, see himself anymore as that whole list of, uh, uh, of um, uh, bullets for his uh, uh, for resume. I'm the, I am the least of all saints. Amen. Then in Galatians 1, watch now. We'll, we'll probably wrap here. Galatians 1. Now, none of us in our right mind tonight would not understand 
that God had a special purpose for the Apostle Paul. And it was from the time he fell on that Damascus road, God set a course for him, sent Ananias to him, put him in that Damascus church. We preached on that whole, the testimony of Paul one time. I'm still blessed by the thoughts of those scriptures. And baptized him and the scales came off his eyes and filled with the Spirit and he started preaching Jesus. And, and man, people were getting saved and then he got in trouble for preaching Jesus. <laughs> and... Um, uh, and then uh, Ananias was questioning whether or not he should deal with him. And Jesus told Ananias, I've got some special things for this, for this guy. He's got special things for you, too, if you'll, if you'll humble yourself as, as Paul did. But, uh, but anyway, so here he is now talking about this early time. And in Galatians, Galatians chapter, number, uh, chapter number 1, and um, beginning in verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Now, see, he, he takes this approach several times in Scripture that his goal was not to please men, uh, but to please God. Now, Paul did it with the right attitude. Some folks do it as a rebellion to God-ordained authority in their life. You, maybe you can understand the difference between those two approaches. I'm not going to please men. I'm out to please God. Well, that doesn't mean we should not be respectful. All right. So for do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Um, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. He said, I didn't get that from man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, by the rev uh, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, for ye have heard of my conversation, life in time past, in the Jews' religion. There's that reference again. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, watch now, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous, there's that word, of the tradition of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now hold on. I've heard preachers, I've heard young, well, I've heard some men quote this verse uh, as if to say that they went out all alone with God and didn't need any input from man. What we're going to find out here is that's not what Paul was saying. What he's saying is here that when God saved him and called him to the ministry, he immediately got alone with God about that thing. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterward, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past is now, uh, now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. Uh, now watch the difference here between Paul and Jehu. And they glorified God in me. This wasn't a Jehu, come see my zeal for the Lord. They glorified God in me. Then 14 years after, I went up to, again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation, that's the leadership of the Lord, and co communicated with them the, that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Who did he communicate this gospel to? Watch now. But privately to them which were of reputation. Watch this now. Lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. You see what he's saying here? What he's saying here is, I wanted to talk to these uh, men about what I was preaching and make sure I hadn't missed something. That's what he's saying. So when you, if you look at that and then go back over here where he said, I did not confer with men, he's not talking about his message. He cross-checked his message with the apostles. That's humility. He had already been preaching it. He had already seen results from it. But he was very careful about gospel tradition. That's one thing where our modern church has thrown off all that. They're like pop-up marketplaces now. But anyway, 
I didn't, I wanted to make sure I hadn't done all this in vain. And somebody said, well, how come he didn't find out sooner? There wasn't any cell phones. There wasn't any email. He couldn't text it. And there wasn't any Facebook. You understand? So when he had a chance to see him, hey, hey, I got to talk to you guys, right? But neither Titus, verse 3, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privately to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. Now watch verse 5. To whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour. In other words, he, he dealt with that uh, uh, a prickly group for a while. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Oh, the vision of Paul. Paul realized if I engage these... Uh, uh, even these uh, uh, false teachers in the wrong way, these folks that have come in to spy out our liberty and bring us into bondage back under the law, he said, if I don't deal with this correctly, uh, I am going to harm the overall work of the gospel. He wasn't concerned about himself. He wasn't concerned about winning an argument. He was concerned about the testimony of Jesus Christ and the fruitfulness of the gospel. All right. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth not man's person. Now, if Paul had shown them respect in previous verses, one thing we should make sure that in verse 6, he was not being disrespectful to these men. For they who seem to be somewhat, watch now, in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the, uh, of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentile. All of this unity and all this agreement is proving it's the same Holy Spirit. That's the point here. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of what? He wasn't bucking them. He wasn't rebelling against them. Uh, he wasn't coming in there to show himself something that they were not. They gave him the right hands of fellowship that he should go, that the, we should go unto the heathen, that's the Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision, uh, the Jews. Verse 10, only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I was also forward to do. This is the humility of a man that got over himself for the sake of the gospel. If there's one thing that will blind the work of the, that will confuse and, and uh, smoke uh, the, conf the confusion of faith uh, with the work of the ministry, it's when Christians can't get over themselves. When they have to show that they're better, when they have to show that they're more fruitful, when they, have to, when, they show that, when they have to show that they know more, when they have to show that they can do more, all of that clouds the gospel. All, 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 when they have to show off, it clouds the gospel. Um, that was not Paul. I am the least of the apostles. He proved it in these two chapters. I, you know what? I, get, I need to get with these guys and make sure I'm right. Do you, do you see what he, he's recognizing there? His own humanity. What a blessing it must have been to him when they added nothing to him and they said this to him. That's the Holy Ghost. Amen. Same message. How about this, Paul? Why don't you go to the Gentiles and we'll take care of the Jews? Amen. Amen. So this flaunting of self has got to go before Jesus will ever have any hope of being glorified in his church. Let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer, please. Thank you for your time tonight and patience through that.